So in the second part, we're going to look to see how angelic hands have been working under the direction of the Lord Jesus to bring about this change to ensure that there are the division into sheep nations who are on Israel's side, there are goat nations who are opposed to Israel, uh, and that they are clearly identified. Uh, And we can see God working before our very eyes, bringing about this great change. So how does a goat nation become a sheep? Well, it is uh, on the basis of whether they bless Israel or whether they curse Israel. Again, we put that uh, promise to Abraham that all families of the earth are going to be blessed. That's all families that remain after God's judgment have been poured out. Many saints will be raised, but not all chosen. Many nations will be in existence, but not all will go into the kingdom. Kingdom age is going to be quite different from the world of today. And so we can see that God is preparing certain nations to be on Israel's side. And this was uh, a fascinating report in uh, in Israeli um, mosaic, uh, which had this headline, how Israel's former allies became its foremost enemies and vice versa. Where? Israel was once aligned with Turkey and Iran against the Arab states. It now finds itself aligned with those former enemies against Turkey and Iran. And the announcement in the summer of 2020 that Israel was normalizing relations with the UAE and heralded a dramatic shift in Middle Eastern diplomacy. When Bahrain joined in quick succession, followed later by Saudi and then Morocco, it became clear that Arab governments would no longer be antagonistic to Israel. And so this is the the great work. Uh, Nations like uh, Iran and Iraq, 30, 40 years ago, we would have said were sheep nations, but now they have proved themselves to be very much goat nations. And Arab nations, remember when the British Empire was failing and New interpretations of prophecy was put forward and the emphasis was put on the Arab nations. These are the great enemies of Israel. Well, we know from scripture that wasn't right. The Arabs, uh, as part of Abraham's children, are to be blessed in the kingdom. And so we see this change around, showing that these former enemies of Israel are now blessing Israel. They're turning from goats into sheep. It's so exciting to see this work. And just as the scripture tells us of an Elijah work among the Jewish nation in this interval period between the return of Jesus to the household and the invasion of Israel and the battle of Armageddon. So I, I think there will be a parallel work among the Arab nations because there are abundant passages speaking of Arab nations wholeheartedly accepting Israel and their sacrifices, Isaiah chapter 60, coming up uh, upon God's altar with blessed, great blessings. And so Abraham's other children, as well as Gentiles, are being turned into sheep nations. And these Abraham Accords are the process which we can see today, whereby these other children turn to bless Israel and therefore will be blessed in the kingdom. And so we know that not all Arabs are descendants from Abraham. Abraham had many children through Keturah and through Ishmael. But it doesn't matter if they're not directly descended from Abraham. If they work with Israel and support Israel, they will be accounted as Israel's seed and be blessed in the kingdom. And so I think in the the parallel work as Elijah, and presumably Elisha and John the Baptist are working in Israel, and then others raise saints, and Abraham himself 
could be working among the Gentile nations, giving them that final preparation before the dramatic events of uh, the invasion of Israel, but, you know, preparing them for what is going to happen. So it is an exciting period. And just as in Old Testament times, angels work behind the scenes, so immortal saints can be working behind the scenes, uh, bringing about the final preparations of the goat and sheep nations. So let's start with that well-known section in Ezekiel chapter 13, having described the multitudinous goat nations that come against Israel to destroy her, are described another grouping of nations who are on Israel's side. They're not listed out in the same detail as the enemies, but sufficient to guide us. Uh, it says the foremost among them are Sheba and Dedan. So that takes us to the Arabian Peninsula. This is where uh, not only the Hamatic, but the Abrahamic uh, Sheba and Dedan reside. Uh, and so it is in this area that we will find the sheep nations. There will be the merchants of Tarshish. And we shall look at, you know, the evidence that Britain is the merchant power, the latter-day merchant power of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof. And so it is clear that there is a, a coalition of nations working with Israel, friendly with Israel, in the area and merchant powers coming in from outside that area, but working with the Sheba Dedan and with Israel in these last days. And that's exactly what we see, isn't it? So turn with me to Isaiah chapter 23, because this is a very relevant passage for what is happening uh, at this very moment, really. It's a burden. Uh, in verse 1, against Tyre, that there's trouble for Tyre. Uh, and in verse 6, where the slide begins there, that uh, Tyre is told to pass over to Tarshish. Now, we know in the days of uh, when this was written, that Britain was the Tarshish power and traded with iron and lead and tin in the fairs um, in Tyre. And Tyre is told, pass ye over to Tarshish. How the inhabitants of the Isle of uh, Tyre. Is this your joyous city whose antiquity is of ancient days? Her own feet shall carry her afar off to Sodom. We're not going to look at it, but one can trace how through history, when Tyre was destroyed by Alexander the Great, that that maritime power moved westward to Venice and to Genoa up to Holland, and then eventually in 1600s, arriving at Tarshish shores, at Britain's shores. And then uh, missed out some verses, but then it comes to, uh, you know, that, that is what's going to happen. Tire's going to be broken, his power's going to move away. And then it deals with our times. And so in uh, verse 15, it shall come to pass in that day that Tyre shall be forgotten 70 years according to the days of one king. And after the end of 70 years shall Tyre sing as an harlot. And verse uh, 17, it shall come to pass at the end of 70 years that Yahweh will visit Tyre. She shall return to her hire. She shall commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world upon the face of the earth. And her merchandise and her hire shall be holiness to Yahweh. It shall not be treasured nor laid up, for her merchandise will be for them that dwell before Yahweh to eat sufficiently and for durable clothing. So this is indication indicating that there is to be a period of 70 years, according to the years of one king, one ruler, where the latter-day Tyre power loses her power. She's forgotten for 70 years. At the end of that period, 
she revives. And why does she revive? Well, it's not for her own wealth, uh, though that's what she thinks it's all for. Uh, but no, this is in God's purpose. It's to help the Lord Jesus when after Armageddon uh, and Israel's enemies have been buried in Haman Gog, that there will be a power, a tire, and for young lions who will be there to help bring the Jews back to their land, to help rebuild, because after the almighty earthquake, when the Mount of Olives is split in two at the beginning of the Battle of Armageddon, then there will be a vast amount of building work. There will still be a temple rebuilt uh, upon the much changed topography of the land of Israel. And we know from other passages, this is the work of Tyre and her companions uh, to work with the Lord Jesus in rebuilding, getting the temple ready, building up Israel. And so this is so fascinating to us. We happen to live uh, in Britain and happen to live at this period when the ending of the 70 years is at hand. Since you last saw this, Prince Philip has died, but the Queen, although not as strong as she is, 95 years old, is resuming her duties with a, a quickened step. Uh, and she is the longest lived and longest reigning British monarch. She is the longest serving uh, female head of state in the world today, in world history. And she is the world's oldest living monarch. And she is the oldest reigning current monarch. And the oldest and longest reigning, longest serving current head of state. That's quite a, a handful of accolades, isn't it, to the Queen? 70, she's well in her 70th year. In a few months' time, February 2020, she'll be at the end of the 70 years of her reign. And I believe that coincides with the ending of the period of the forgottenness for Britain. You can see the preparations for her to explode upon the world stage at the end of those 70 years. Uh, let me state now before I forget that it doesn't mean well, we've got to wait until at least February 2022 before the Lord comes. The Lord can come back to his household at any time. All these final bits will drop into place in that interlude between his coming and the Battle of Armageddon. So let's think about Brother Thomas, 1948, sorry, 1848, uh, writing Alpha's Israel, laying out the groundwork of our historic understanding of Latter-day Bible prophecy. The British Empire was fairly small, but he saw there was an important work for Britain, for uh, India, uh, the, the two Tarshish powers, the Eastern Tarshish and the Western Tarshish. He saw that there was a role for the merchants of Tarshish. And over time, that uh, has come to pass. When my father was born in 1912, the British Empire had quite expanded. But by the time I was born, uh, it had begun to decline. Uh, Australia, South Africa, Canada had gained their independence. But Britain was very heavily involved in the Middle East. But by the time my firstborn was born, uh, that empire had greatly declined. And by the time we come to uh, the end of the millennium or the, the, the century, sorry, um, then the empire had disappeared. But what had arisen in its place? Championed by the Queen, its place has been taken by the Commonwealth of nations. And this is a very live and active association of the former members and other that weren't part of the Commonwealth, grouping together, choosing voluntarily to work with Britain. The young lions are no longer cubs. They're completely independent. They can do what they want without any uh, British control. But in a remarkable way, 
they choose to be an alliance of a commonwealth of nations working and <clears throat> cooperating together. And the emphasis very much for Britain as she looked to her future is east of Suez, the Indo-Pacific region. And when one looks at what the Indo-Pacific region covers, it very much covers the nations of Australia and New Zealand, India, and the many other little Commonwealth countries of Africa and in the Indian Pacific Oceans. And of course, Britain is rebuilding herself as a merchant power, a trading power. And roughly 90%, and as far as Britain is concerned, 95% of her trade is transported by sea. So it's very important for her that she keeps her sea links open. And there is the big threat, Russia and China, that she has to counter. And so we see that things are rapidly changing. Um, this emphasis that some brethren expounding um, prophecy on, on the Arabs being the great enemies, uh, is, is totally wrong. Because they're going to be not on Gog's side, they're going to be on Israel's side. And it takes attention away from the true enemy, which is false Christianity. It's false Christianity. It's the Vatican that's going to rally the nations to come against Israel. And they will receive their due punishment. They are goat nations. So one of the oldest alliances, it's not the oldest, one of the oldest alliances is the Five Eyes Intelligence Alliance. This grouping of nations, Canada, America, Britain, Australia, and New Zealand, has its origins in World War II. 1940, Britain had cracked the German cipher codes, and she needed to share this information that she was now able to access German intelligence with her allies who were fighting with her against Germany. And so this alliance was formed of these allies that she knew she could trust, because if word got out, then the ciphers would be changed and Britain would be back to square one. So it, it was an alliance that had its origins there and has continued since. These five nations share intelligence. They trust each other. They work together. And so... This was an uh, interesting little bit um, in the beginning of October that India could be uh, joining Five Eyes. Again, that would be quite a significant grouping of these uh, countries, these English-speaking, these young lions with the old mother lion grouping together. But there was this uh, interesting comment uh, far more interesting than Orcas, and we'll just look at Orcas next, is to watch the evolution of the Five Eyes, the Intelligence Consortium of the United States, Britain, Australia, Canada, and New Zealand. The five major, the three major powers have already woven an alliance moving well beyond intelligence. The most important point is that a very real international alliance system centered on the ocean is emerging. NATO is still there, but its mission and capabilities in the event of war are unclear. This English speaking alliance moves towards, moves forward, sorry, in steps. And so we're, <clears throat> we're seeing this coming together in a very deep alliance, not just in sharing intelligence, but as a military alliance to defend the things that Britain stands for. But what is so fascinating is the latest coalition, AUKUS. And this is what The Economist had to say. Uh, the strategic reverberations of the AUKUS deal will be big and lasting. Just occasionally you can see the tectonic plates 
of geopolitics shifting in front of your eyes. The unveiling last week of a trilateral defence pact between Australia, the United Kingdom and the United States is providing another of those rare occasions. So this was the news, remember, uh, back in the middle of September, it was announced that Australia, who had placed an order with France for nuke, not with for submarines, uh, had decided that with the change situation in 2021, that the type of submarine that she had on order wouldn't be suitable, and she was switching the order to nuclear submarines, which she could only obtain from Britain and Australia. Now, the AUKAS, as I say, is this grouping of these nations, and it has had enormous repercussions because France has uh, gone off on a tangent uh, because of being thwarted in this deal and the switching of the deal from France to Britain and America. Uh, and that has had all sorts of repercussions in Britain breaking away from Europe to be independent. She's not part of that grouping. She's got to go her own way. And so this is very encouraging as we look at the work of uh, the old lion and the young lions coming together. And in fact, uh, another interesting uh, effect that this AUKAS has had is on Liz Truss's dealings with nations. She had been very successful in the past year in making many trade agreements. But now she can see a new aspect and that is not just a trade agreement for trade, but bringing in security, tying in as well as trade, the use of the navies and the weaponry that these nations that she wants to deal with, bring them into an alliance so that in the event of a battle against China and Russia, she has more allies. So she's now looking at trade agreements with this added eye of security alliances. Again, so interesting. This is just happening as the 70 year clock is ticking to an end. And uh, just earlier on Tuesday, it was announced that New Zealand could join AUKUS. So that will be thrilling. So there's another alliance which is coming to the fore, uh, an old one. Kanzuk, um, that's made up of the initials from Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and United Kingdom. And although these countries are at the extremities of uh, the world, as it were, yet in today's world, with instant communication, that, that doesn't really matter. And uh, Liz Truss has signed up multi-million uh, trade deals with Canada, with Australia, and now just uh, previous week with New Zealand. And now what she's setting her eyes upon is to bring them together as a four-way partnership. So, you know, we really are seeing thrilling things taking place before our eyes. And so this was an account just on Monday. Brexit is a gold mine. The United Kingdom has set its sights on the massive New Zealand, Canada, Australia trade zone. And according to one Tory MP who's been pushing for this, as the country reaps the benefits of Brexit, the United Kingdom is considering a mega trade deal with New Zealand, Canada and Australia next year. According to the experts, the so-called Kanzak Pact would constitute the world's largest government and third largest economy. I'm not quite sure what it means by the world's largest government. Uh, the Chinese have nearly 3,000 members of their parliament. So if you add up all the MPs, it doesn't equal that. But uh, third largest economy, yes, that would be. So um, here's coming together more than just business, but security. That's what's on the move. 
and just on Wednesday, the budget, hidden within the budget, buried within the announcements, was this important one from our aspect about the merchant navies. Britain now is freed from the restraints that the EU placed on um, merchant navies and flags of convenience. It was very limiting. Now, Britain can do what she likes. She has in this budget enlarged the scope of the different types of uh, vessels that could fly under the red ensign. And so, uh, as this side passage says, our tonnage tax will, for the first time ever, reward companies for adopting the UK's merchant shipping flag, the red ensign. Um, the Chancellor said it's entirely fitting for a country with such a proud maritime history as ours. And the UK Chamber of Shipping chap said the move will put great back into British shipping. This package will immediately strengthen the UK flag, encourage innovation in the offshore energy sector and attract international investment. So we can see with this one step, on Wednesday, that Britain is boosting her merchant navy and those nations who are prepared to put their ships under the control of the British ensign and who will be expected in time of emergency to use those vessels on behalf of Britain. So again, very exciting. Now back in June of this year, the Daily Telegraph had this passage on Britain is still the second world's second naval power and it's up to us to with, uphold the laws of the sea. Now I was a bit puzzled by that because I don't think of Britain as the second naval power but it, it explained when it comes to the ability to project naval force we are second only to the United States. That's true. When one looks at tonnage, and this is before Wednesday, this will change as a result of Wednesday in the budget, but Britain is number five um, in the rankings as, well, as uh, tonnage is concerned. As far as actual strength is concerned, she's rated number four. But as power projection is concerned, yes, she is number two, second only to the United States. She has building up her Royal Navy. She now has two uh, state-of-the-art uh, aircraft carriers. She's using state-of-the-art building techniques to speed up building boats and to increase the flexibility in their buildings so they can a basic design can be used for different sorts of boats um, so using the latest uh, computer technology to speed these things up and so she is building up her merchant her uh, royal naval fleet and uh, is number two in her power projection and at the moment, she is showing to the world that she is number two in the world. Because on May the 22nd, that's quite a long time ago, the carrier strike group left Portsmouth, led by the new aircraft carrier HMS Queen Elizabeth. On board were helicopters and F-35 from British and uh, American Air Force, together with a, a number of naval ships, Royal Navy ships. There was a, a Dutch ship and an American destroyer also set out from Portsmouth to project power around the world. They went to Gibraltar, through the um, Mediterranean. Some of them went up to the Black Sea, uh, much to the antagonism of Russia. Uh, others fired missiles at ISIS in uh, Iraq. Some visited Israel. They then passed through the Suez Canal and called in at Oman. Oman has built a special port for Britain and America to house the two new aircraft carriers. It's anticipated at least one of them will be based in Oman. And then went on to Singapore exercises, well, went past India, exercises with the Indian Navy, 
Singapore exercises with the Singapore Navy, and then on to Japan and Korea, uh, doing exercises with their navies, with the Australian navies, with the American fleet in the Pacific. And then in September, started the homeward journey back to Singapore, more exercise, a week of exercises there, back to India. And those exercises came to an end on Wednesday. Um, and now she is departing from India to go back to Iman and uh, retrace her steps back through the series and back to Britain uh, due to arrive back on the first week of December. But intense training with like-minded naval forces so that in time of emergency, if China does seek to take Taiwan, and then here's a groupage who have exercised together, who can come together to take action. So the emphasis is Britain will be have a, a big influence in this Indo-Pacific region. When two weeks ago they were doing their exercises with Indonesia, the commander of the UK Strike Force said he highlighted the UK's intent to tilt the Indo-Pacific. UK intends to have a much more persistent presence in the Indo-Pacific region. This is where the majority of the young lions are. So Britain and Israel. Israel's and British relations have varied, haven't they? But very firmly, Britain is moving to be a sheep and not a goat, as far as Israel is concerned, and the Arab nations are concerned. So part of this uh, naval force called in, and again, as it says there, it was symbolic of the strong joint relations between Israel and the United Kingdom. And in fact, Britain is encouraging the new startup countries, uh, companies in Israel, not to bother with Europe, not to bother with the United States, come to Britain. We're waiting, we're ready for you. We have the structure. You can come here and build your companies up and we can spin them off. Uh, and Britain is so close to Israel as far as travel is concerned. It's only two time zones away which makes business so much easier than dealing with, say, California, which is uh, half a day away, as far as uh, dealing on the telephone is concerned. And the newly appointed Foreign Secretary Liz Truss at the Conservative Conference said, there is no closer friend and ally to Britain than Israel. So certainly the UK is changing into a sheep nation. And she's going back to her old position of training with the Arab nations. Just earlier last month, the end of last month, the Crown Prince of the UAE, who has vast wealth at his disposal, was given the full treatment, uh, changing the guards and dinner with the queen. Uh, and so uh, there were several substantial investment deals uh, were done and what lies ahead, vast uh, investments that these countries want to make into Britain and Britain wants to send her skilled things into these Arab nations. So this was back the end of uh, September, here we go, Brexit Britain starts talking on a nine trillion trade pact today. This was the comprehensive and progressive agreement for the Trans-Pacific Partnership, very clumsy, um, but uh, these are the nations that ring round the Pacific, which includes uh, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, China, um, Singapore, um, all, all these countries and uh, that want to trade together, are trading together, and very much want Britain to join them. And uh, Britain too wants to join them because 
this is where the growth is. It's not in Europe, it's in the Far East. And so the talks, the first round of negotiations are taking place. It will take some time, but hopefully sometime next year, um, Britain will be part of this grouping of Pacific Rim nations and very wealthy coalition of nations. And then a couple of weeks ago, another one on the way, UK in talks for a mega trade deal with six countries. Those six countries were the Gulf Cooperation Council, the very nations that we've been looking at in our maps for years. And here is Britain seeking to have a, a mega trade deal with this grouping of six Arab nations, the Gulf Cooperation Council, how exciting that is. So 14 weeks of negotiations or consultations, I should say, have started in Britain and in these countries to find out just what kind of a trade deal is wanted so that at the beginning of 2022, they can get down to the task of hammering out an agreement. Of course, hammering out agreement with friends is much easier than with uh, enemies like Europe has turned out to be. So here we have this exciting coming together of these countries. It comes at a time when Britain is breaking further and further away from Europe. And we're at this fascinating time, brothers and sisters and young people, when Britain has got to make that break. Europe has done her best to retain Britain under her control. She doesn't want Britain to go free. Uh, a freedom for Britain to do her own thing is something that the is uh, something the EU doesn't want to see. And that's why there's been all this trouble over the Northern Ireland Protocol, because what Europe is wanting to do is to retain control of United Northern Ireland, sorry, uh, in uh, EU control. Britain doesn't want that. Britain wants Europe to leave control of Northern Ireland and Northern Ireland to come under Britain's control, which it isn't at the moment under this uh, uh, this uh, Northern Ireland Protocol. Uh, and we've reached a crisis point. Lord Frost in his negotiations has said, you got to the middle of November, it's not working, we're going to take the exit clause, Article 16, uh, unless you change it. Now they made, put forward some proposals, but nowhere near enough. Their proposals still involve Europe having control over Northern Ireland. So expect within the next few weeks, the next few months, till we get to the end of February 2022, that Britain is going to pull out of the Northern Ireland Agreement and probably will pull out of the trade negotiation agreement that she made at the end of last year and trade on world trade terms. Europe is threatening severe retaliation for that, threatening that uh, she'll impose great tariffs. Um, and today's headline is Britain must be punished for Brexit, says France, and France is the foremost in causing trouble for Britain as far as trade with Europe is concerned. Uh, and what's so interesting, just a week ago was revealed that actually, Europe does more trade with Britain than she does with China. Uh, almost 30% more trade is uh, done with Britain than with China. So if she makes problems, she'll be the one that loses. And Britain has lots of other countries who are willing to do business with her. So we're near the end. It's, uh, Time is passing on, but this is an interesting headline as far as Israel is concerned. Uh, this Avi is a, a Jewish uh, writer. Peace in the Middle East is within our grasp. Only the self-defeating Palestinian leadership stands in the way. And it is true that the greatest obstacle to peace in the Middle East is the Palestinian leadership. But note the... The pride in this headline. And that's the problem because 
wonderful though these Abraham Accords are, they're all being driven by Israel and her feeling of position of strength. Uh, and we know that's not the way forwards. Ultimately, Brit Israel has to be humbled. And that's why Ezekiel 39 explains to us that this time of peace that Ezekiel 38 talks about will be, in God's eyes, a time of trespass. And so God's going to bring again the captivity of Jacob. They're going to be destroyed as a nation. He's then going to finally regather them post Armageddon after that they have borne their shame and all their trespasses whereby they have trespassed against me when they dwelt safely in their land and none made them afraid. So what we're seeing here that exciting to us because it's fulfilling scripture, but it is uh, in God's eyes a trespass because they're trusting in themselves. They've got to be humble. They will be humbled and then they will turn to their gold. Now, other nations are expected to join them. Qatar, Tunisia, Oman, Malaysia are expected soon to join up. Saudi Arabia is still hovering, but she is using a backdoor way. SoftBank is uh, a UAE bank, but Saudi Arabia is very heavily invested in that. And she has sanctioned that the UAE can set up SoftBank branches in Israel, which is, this is a business bank for businesses. And so in a, a backdoor method, as it were, Saudi is already participating in the Abraham Accords. And th this chart with this little update at the bottom there just shows how uh, that from January to July last year to this year, dramatic increase in trade. Uh, and just at uh, uh, flame, uh, can't be the 30th, because we're not, yes, it is today. So, uh, comparing the full year of 2020 with the first seven months of 2021, so looking at the whole of last year and comparing with this, just seven months of this year, trade between Israel and Arab countries grew by 234%, absolutely staggering. And just the beginning of September, this new port in Haifa, brand new port, state of the art, able to take much bigger ships than she's ever been able to handle before. Uh, and with much less labor using automated unloading methods, she is ready to handle a big boost in trade. And what was very interesting just a fortnight ago was the fact that Israel and the United States uh, are coordinating their navies uh, in preparation for battle against Iran. Now, America has been one of those countries for Israel against Israel, uh, under Trump very much for Israel, very goatish, under Biden very, uh, sorry, under uh, Trump very sheepish, but under Biden, as under Obama, uh, very goatish. Now, remember, he is a Roman Catholic, and so he's echoing the uh, Vatican line, the Vatican influence. That is not expected to, well, even survive this term, let alone another term. So there will be changes. It, it hasn't worked out uh, as the Americans thought, and I think there will be great changes so that uh, America is truly a sheep nation. But there are elements, and as I say, this is a step, a sheep-like step, coordinating their, coordinating their navies uh, to be able to help Israel against Iran. And uh, just on Wednesday, this report on Israel prepares for Iran strike with the largest ever Air Force drill. Let me just enlarge that so I can read it. As noted yesterday, there are a number of indications that Israel and her allies are gearing up for some sort of Iran strike. One of them was the big blue flag Air Force exercise in the Negev, held with eight nations 
including the UAE. Israel's had plenty of joint exercises before, but the introduction of the UAE and the timing of the exercise amid heightened Iranian tensions makes this exercise stand out. So uh, in the budget, which Israel's hoping to pass in the next two weeks, they've allocated the equivalent of a, a billion pounds to buy armaments, buster bombs, and that from America. Uh, a headline yesterday, Israel and Australia discuss free trade agreement, boosting trade relations. So again, just enlarging that, uh, they had a virtual talk on examining the viability of a free trade agreement between the two countries and examining ways and tools to strengthen trade relations between Israel and Australia. So again, exciting, here are the young lions. They, just as Israel and Britain have had a trade agreement, now the young lions are also forming their own trade agreements with Israel. This is what we would expect from scripture. This is happening before our eyes. And so just final slides here. The, the very latest is uh, India, Israel, UAE, and United States. This was a result of a phone a Zoom call last week. The Indian trade minister was in Israel and they sat by side and Zoom called to uh, India and America and formed a new alliance, um, Indo-US-Israel-AUE grouping. And this is going to focus on developing the infrastructure of the region uh, and bringing India into the equation. So, as this says, the officials participating were not cobbled together at random. Their countries represent an emerging alliance, this new Middle East quad, an emerging alliance that can play a central role in India's and the region's economic future. And this all springs out. They have worked in the past, but uh, this is bringing more life into it. And back in the end of August, India uh, pulled together a report entitled India's Arab Mediterranean Corridor, a paradigm shift in the strategic connect connectivity to Europe. Uh, and what this is, is India seeing through these Abraham Accords, joining in, taking advantage of the great, the great trade that India will achieve. Now, at the moment, that trade has to come by ship up through the uh, Red Sea, subject to pirates and that kind of thing, through the expensive Suez Canal, and then onwards into Europe. What this partnership, part of this partnership, is to develop a much easier way for trade to flow backwards and forwards. A short transition from India to the United Arab Emirates, and they've got a port on the eastward side. They don't have to go through the Straits of Hamas. Rail already exists from that port across Saudi Arabia into Jordan. What is lacking is about 150 miles to link that with Israel's all, um, existing railway, which goes to the Jordan border and onto Haifa, uh, the great new port. So as long as this 150 miles can be built across Jordan, then India will be able to take the short route, train route, short route again to state-of-the-art port in Greece, and then onward into Europe. And this is seen as to be part of the fruits, the Abraham Accords, the increased trade that is expected from this region can use this rail network uh, and these new ports to do that trade. So we, we've seen, brothers and sisters, young people, this amazing work that the uh, angels are doing. As this, this uh, article said, this is a, a paradigm shift of enormous geopolitical consequences that could reshape India's role in the Eurasian economic order. And remember that India is one of those Tarshish powers uh, so, so thrilling that this is happening. And goat nations 
are turning into sheep nations. And sadly, some sheep nations are turning into goat nations. But we're standing right at the time of the end. I stand at the door and knock. So we've got to be prepared, brothers and sisters. And that's what Brother Stephen is going to encourage us into. It's the Lord Jesus is coming back to the household any moment soon. And so very quickly, I'll put up my final slide and then close down. So milestones, still some copies left. Uh, that spans the events of last year in the Bible magazine. Uh, new issue should be out any time now. It probably is out, just hasn't reached us yet, um, where I do quarterly updates. And then three or four times a week, I send out snippets. I've been such a vast volume, but if you want to really be kept up to date with these exciting things, and just send me an email to uh, don at milestonesuk.org. So thank you for your patience.